I'm going to start off giving a little background on my life. I'm prior to the religion of Islam. Um, I was raised, alhamdulillah, by Muslim parents. Both of my mother and father accepted the religion of Islam before I was born. At the age of three, I witnessed my mother and father get murdered in front of me. So from three years old, I was raised with my grandparents who raised me upon the religion of Christianity. I grew up with grandparents that they, they tried their best um, to the best of their ability to raise me and my brothers upon goodness and care. But we was knuckleheads. You know, at a very young age, we started to run the streets. And I remember the first time that my older brothers and cousins started getting heavy into the streets. That lifestyle seemed fat. I was fascinated by that lifestyle. I remember the first time my cousin came in the house and he had drugs and he had brand new sneakers and brand new clothes. I thought at that particular time of my life that this is the life that I wanted for myself. So I started to follow my brothers and my cousins outside and I started to pick up on the game. And I realized that one day I said to myself, I think that it's time for me to basically make that step and try to get more involved into the street life. So I decided to follow my brothers and my cousins and I decided to sell drugs. And I went to one of the old heads or the older brothers or the older people from my neighborhood and I convinced them to give me some drugs. And when this individual, he put his trust in me, he gave me some drugs. The first day that I went outside on my block, like many youngsters, you know, at that particular time of my age, maybe 13, 14 years old, when we at that time of our age, many of us, we think we know everything. You cannot tell us anything. So when this brother, when this individual gave me the drugs, that pride got into my heart that I felt like I was a man. The first day that I went outside and I tried to hustle, the police rolled up on me and I ran into the store and I tried to hide the drugs. I came back outside, I was arrogant. You know, I thought I'd outsmart the police. You gotta understand, it's my first day outside on the block. The police come and I outsmarted the police. Now I got stripes, you know? So when the police pushed me against the wall and they started to check me, they pulled the crack valve out of my pocket and they put me in handcuffs. They put me in jail, they called my grandparents. And of course my grandmother, she put hands on me. When I went back outside on my block, everybody in my neighborhood was clowning me. They made fun of me because I was the individual that cannot sell drugs. I wasn't cool enough. So I told myself from that day, let me try to figure another way that I can do that my brothers and my cousins cannot do. At that particular time, it became a challenge for me to outdo my brothers and my cousins. So I started to write raps. Whatever I would see outside on my block, I would go to my room and I would make a song out of it. And I would come back and I would sing it and I would perform it for the drug dealers. So I started to get a name for myself. You know, like most youngsters, I'm sure a lot of y'all in here can relate. When you start to get a name for yourself in the street, it gives you that sense of pride when you think that you're doing something. So eventually, I got involved with a childhood friend of mine who happened to be the half-brother of Tupac Shakur. And one day, I found out that Tupac and a friend of mine was on their way to New York City, which is approximately 30 minutes train ride from where I'm from in New Jersey. I was able to hop on the train. I was able to go to meet Tupac, get acquainted with my old friend. And Tupac, he asked me to rap for him. And as a youngster at that particular time, and I was excited because this was a chance for me to make it in the industry. I'm sure that some of the youngsters, when they turn on their televisions now, and they look at these rappers, and I was in that same shoes back in the day when I used to look at these rappers on television, I used to say to myself, this is the life that I want for myself. So I, used to, I put myself in a position that no matter what it would take for me to get in that life, I would do it. So here was my chance meeting Tupac for the first time. I was able to give him my demo. I rap for him, and he decided to put me in a rap group, and eventually this rap group was named The Outlaws. I remember the first time that I appeared on a rap record, it was a, rap, a record of Tupac called All Eyes On Me, Me Against The World, and this record sold a couple million. Now I'm getting a little more arrogant because I go back to my neighborhood and the cars are driving past, and I actually hear them play my songs on the radio, or they're bumping my songs in their car, so at that particular time of my life, man, I was arrogant and I thought I made it. And I used to say to myself as a youngster, it can only get better and better from this day on. Um, Tupac, he continued to do music. Every record that he put out, he would put me and my group on his record. So he put another record out called All Eyes On Me, and his record sold over 20 million records worldwide. 
And at this particular time, I was getting a little older, so I was paying attention to Tupac, because at that time, he was my idol. And I noticed that his music started to change. Prior to him coming to Death Row Records, he happened to one day get shot five times in the elevator. He got shot five times and they stole about $40,000 worth of jewelry from Pop. And prior to him coming to Death Row Records, all his music was about death. He had songs called, for example, Death Around the Corner. He used to talk about how he was suicidal, how he didn't want to live, how he didn't enjoy his life. But when he went to Death Row Records, he started to make money for himself. At one particular time, he had a house in Malibu and Calabasas. He owned mansions. He was driving a Rolls Royce. And we had a conversation with Tupac that I didn't forget to this day. He sat me and the rest of the outlaws down and he said, remember how I used to always speak about death. He said, remember how I used to always talk to y'all about I don't want to live anymore. He said, but for some reason now that I have this money and I have this house, he said, for some reason I want to enjoy what I attain. I want to enjoy my life. About three months later, Tupac was in Las Vegas. He got into a fight with an individual. A few hours later, they came back to take revenge. They shot Pac 13 times. He died six days later in the hospital. And I believe that was the first time in my life that I really started to pay attention of death. That was the first time in my life that I realized that I have no control or we have no control over when we're gonna die. Because I watched Tupac, for example, live his life saying that he was wishing for death. And as soon as he started to make a lot of money, the only thing that he wanted to do is live a long life so that he could enjoy what he attained from this dunya, from this worldly life. But even though at that particular time of my life I had no religion, but I started to contemplate, I started to think about that. I started to say, wait a minute, this was an individual that as soon as he wanted to enjoy life, he died. And I started to get curious about what's happening to my friend. I wonder where he's at. I wonder what's happening to him while he's in that grave. So I started to get, you could say, God conscious. I started to wanted to know more about God at this particular time in my life, but I didn't know which way to turn. As I mentioned, my mother and father accepted the religion of Islam, but the people that murdered my mother and father, they was from a group of people in America called the Nation of Islam. I'm not sure if you guys heard of the Nation of Islam. The Nation of Islam, they believe, for example, that Allah is a black man, Audu Bilal. And they believe that there was a prophet who came after um, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who came from Detroit. This was the same religion or the same um, organization that Malcolm X was on until he went to Saudi Arabia. And he realized that Islam is a religion that entails everyone from different countries, from different race, etc. So the people that murdered my mother and father was from this organization. So I grew up hearing my grandmother telling me time after time that the Muslims murdered your parents. So I grew up in my heart having some hatred towards Islam. Being raised in the church at a very young age, I walked away from Christianity, and at this particular time of my life, I only believed in God. I used to say to myself, I have no religion, I only believe in God. But after the death of Tupac, I was curious. You know, I started to get curious about what's going to happen to me after I die. But I continue to do music, me and the rest of the outlaws, we continue to do our music and we put a record out on our home. And this record sold over two million records worldwide. I remember the first check that I received, maybe I'm um, 16 years old, was for about $150,000. Every six months I was receiving checks for $60,000, $80,000. And I started to forget about my de the death of my close friend. And I started to go through the same phase that Tupac was going through. I wasn't thinking about death anymore. I only wanted to enjoy what I started to get from this music industry. So I used to tell myself back then, maybe God loves me. He, put, he provided for me, giving me more and more money. At one particular time of my life, I had three houses. Every time a car would come out, man, I would be the first one at the car dealership making sure that I get that car. And I started to get arrogant. You know, I started to, at 16 years old, cashing checks for $150,000, whatever I want, I was able to obtain. And I'm not talking about the money that I was making off of tours. Most people would say, man, you lived a good life. You actually lived the American dream. But most people didn't know what I was going through. The more money that I was making or the more success that I was getting from the music, music industry, the people didn't realize the struggle that started to happen to me. Even though I was living a good life from the outside looking in, every single night of my life, I couldn't even go to sleep without being high or drunk. And I would sit up some nights and I would ask myself, how come I have money? I have houses, I have cars, I have jewelry, I have fame, but how come I don't have any happiness? 
But at this particular time of my life, I didn't realize the reason of my unhappiness is because I wasn't submitting to the one who created me. So I was making all types of excuses. And I remember one time I sat in my room and I said, this is the reason why I'm not happy because I don't know my mother's side of the family. My father is African American, but my mother, she's Puerto Rican and Cuban, Hispanic and Latino. So I remember I got excited. I thought I found the, the, the key to happiness. So I called my brothers and I called my cousins and my friends. I said, man, pack your clothes in a couple days we're going to Puerto Rico. So I told myself that Shaytan was playing games with me. The reason why you're not happy because you don't even know your roots or your reality or where you come from. So I paid for everybody airline tickets. In fact, I even brought a friend of mine who would be my translator. I said, since I don't know Spanish, you're gonna come down, I'm gonna pay you every day, we're gonna walk the island and you would translate for me. So I remember going down to Puerto Rico, and this is true stories. I remember went to Puerto Rico. You know, it's a beautiful place, beautiful island. I get down there, the first thing that I started doing is go to the nightclub, started partying, go to the beaches, you know, start spending time with the locals. I'm happy for maybe the first of the two days that I'm there. The third or the fourth day, I'm back to my depression. So a couple days later, I went back to America and I sat alone and I told myself, there's no reason for me to live anymore. I pretty much did everything that a person can do in this life. I pretty much have everything a person want. What is the purpose of me living in this dunya? So at this particular time of my life, believe it or not, man, I got out of control. I told myself from this day on, I would drink as much alcohol, I would smoke as much weed, and I would be dumb for the rest of my life until someone killed me. So I would wake up every single day with the intention, how can I destroy my body? How can I destroy my life? Because I was living in denial. I used to wake up and I used to pray that this could be the day that somebody take me out of my misery. And one day with that same attitude, I happened to be in a recording studio and I got into a fight with my little brother and it was a Muslim who broke the fight up. And he invited me to the masjid. From calling me after calling me, I decided to take his invitation. Even though I didn't trust this individual, because I used to believe that the Muslims, like most of us in America or Western countries, we believe what we see about Islam or CNN or the news or what my grandmother used to tell me. So I didn't really trust this individual. But this was the individual who stopped me from killing my own brother. So I felt deep in my heart that I owed this individual his, his rights back. So after him calling me, I said, you know what, I'm going to go to the mass I remember I called about maybe 15, 20 of my boys, 30 of my boys. I even went there with a loaded gun. And I went to the masjid just with the intention to say hello to this individual and then I left. This masjid was actually in a city called South Central Los Angeles. I'm not sure if anybody heard of South Central LA. This is a gang infested neighborhood. Um, it's in the middle of gang violence and it's in a poor poverty stricken community. So when I got there, I pulled up in the front of the masjid. I had an $80,000 Lexus outside. When I got in front of inside the masjid, I noticed that there was individuals in the masjid. Some of them was getting off the bus. Some of them didn't have no vehicle. Some of the clothes that they was dressed with, it wasn't up to par. But I noticed that every single one of them had a smile on their face. And I started to get curious that day and I started to ask myself, these individuals, they don't have the money that I have. They don't have the car that I have outside, but these people seem happy. And I wanted to know what, what was making these individuals happy. So I stayed at the Masjid and I just wanted to pay attention. To be honest, I didn't believe them. You know, I didn't believe that these individuals were being truthful. So I said, the longer I stay in this Masjid, the more that they true side are gonna come out. Because I grew up in an environment, man, that I didn't see happy people. I come from a music industry why I didn't see happy people in the music industry. Everyone in the entertainment business is doped up, coked up, or high off of some type of drug because they escape in the reality. They don't want to live in reality, so everyone in the industry is high. I come from a neighborhood, everybody is high. So this from the first time in a long time that I walked into an environment and no one is high, but they smiling. So I wanted to know what these people was about. So the more that I sat there, I seen the brotherhood, they walked in, everybody gives salams to each other, they hug, they shake their hands. Deep in my heart, I knew I wanted this for myself. So I started to get more curious, and prayer time came. The brother told me to make salat with him, and I told him I don't know how to pray. You know, but this brother, mashallah, you know some of the American brothers, they very forceful. You know what I mean? This brother basically forced me into salat. He said, no man, you have to pray with us. You have to do what we do. Just look at me, whatever I do, do. But when you put your face on the floor, 
You're only going to be praying to the one who created you alone. There's no partnership. There's nothing between you and the one who created you. So I went ahead with what the brother advised me to do. And after prayer time came, I asked this individual to give me literature of Islam, give me the translation of the Quran. And for some reason, I was intrigued to know about this religion. I remember leaving my boys and I drove straight to my house. And I remember getting home. It could have been an early night, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night, which I would have never done. You know, but this particular night, I wanted to read what was in that book. So when I started to read the literature of Islam, and I was surprised to see and read names of prophets that I used to hear my Christian grandmother say around the house, such as David, Isaac, Solomon, um, Jesus, Abraham, Moses. And I started to get to the point about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how he was sent to the whole of mankind. And I started to read the Quran, even though it was in an English translation. When I started to read the Quran instantly, I knew that these cannot be the words of a man. You know, growing up in a, a Christian household reading the Bible, I always felt that this wasn't the correct way for me to live my life. But the first time that I read the Quran, I said that there is no way that a man could come up with these words. The more that I read this book, the more of the fact that I knew the reason why I wasn't happy, because I wasn't living my life according to what Allah prescribed for me to live. And now we ask ourselves, because alhamdulillah, Allah guided us to the religion of Islam and there's no greater blessing that we can have other than the religion of Islam and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu Nothing is more greater than us than this religion. But unfortunately, many of us, and I'm speaking about myself first, now that Allah guided us to the religion of Islam, many of us forget this great blessing that Allah prescribed upon us. Many of us forget, many of us sometimes we feel in our heart that Allah guided us, we don't need to do no more. Sometimes we believe we're gonna die upon the religion of Islam. We ask Allah to make us die upon the religion of Islam, but we get laid back all of a sudden. Some of us have this religion and we turn in our back on the religion of Islam. The greatest blessing we can have is this deen. Some of us, unfortunately, you have Muslims. Muslims, even in this country, that's gang members. Muslims and gangs. You have Muslims that's trying to go towards a life that, alhamdulillah, by the mercy of Allah, that I was able to escape from. You got Muslims that's running away from their religion just to get in the music industry. We have Muslim Shabab youth that if you ask them what is their role models, they would name every single rapper on the television, but they have no idea about the Sahaba. We have Muslims that running away from the religion of Islam because they believe what Hollywood is putting on television. They believe this facade, this fake life. We believe that this life is going to offer us something good. This life that they show us on television maybe for five minutes, for 20 minutes, for 30 minutes, for one hour. We have Muslims believing that the religion of Islam cannot give them what this life is giving them. Man, this is not the truth. The religion of Islam is from the one who created us. How can we as Muslims go wrong following the religion of the one who created the heavens and the earth? How many Muslims come to me and say, how can I get in the music industry? How many Muslims we know don't pray in the masajid, don't pray in the masjid, don't practice their religion? How many Muslims, and I'm talking, unfortunately, we're not looking down upon y'all, but we're lying, this is sad. As imitate me, Arayim Allah, he said, whenever the Muslims imitate the non-Muslims, it is due to a disease from their heart. So when we walking around and we see the Shabbat and they walking around acting like gangsters in their mind, they might believe they have some type of honor. But in the sight of Allah, this is a despicable sight to, a position to be in. As Ibn Taymiyyah, he said that we have a disease in our heart if we want to be like the Kufar, if we want to be like the non-Muslims. When none of us should be like the people, we should be guiding these people to the religion of Islam. Most of the people in this room, I'm sure their parents came from other Muslim countries to invite them to give you guys a better way of life. Some of the Muslims came here from um, war-stricken countries, from poverty-stricken countries, and all of a sudden, how do you think your parents feel that when they bring you to a country like this, all of a sudden, their children are the ones that's being involved in criminal activities in the neighborhood? How can we invite the people to the religion of Islam when the Muslims are the ones being the criminals, burning cars? They tell me here, man, the Muslims are running around burning people's vehicles. The Muslims are doing this. How can we invite a person to the religion of Islam and we behaving in this way? And we believe behaving in this manner? How can we invite the people to the religion of Islam and we, invite, we smoke more marijuana than them? We drink more alcohol than them? The religion of Islam is not only about talk, but it's about our actions. It's about our actions. 
Maybe Allah will raise us on Yom Kiyama questioning us about the neighbors, our non-Muslim neighbors. Did we invite them to the religion of Islam? And the best way to invite the people to religion of Islam is our clock, our manners, our actions. But how can we have good manners and actions if we don't even know the religion of Islam? We don't even know the religion of Islam. We don't even know Tawheed properly and I'm speaking to myself first. How can we invite the people to the religion of Islam and we firstly not implement it in our lives? It's very important, brothers and sisters, that we realize that every single one of us in this room going to die. As Allah says in the Quran, do not die except as Muslims. Do not die except as Muslims. The scholar said, meaning that we should live our life as Muslims so that we can die the way we live our lives. But we cannot hope that we can be gangsters this year and we hope that we die as a Muslim. Or we in nightclubs today and we hope that when the angel of death comes to us, we is good Muslim. It doesn't work like that. We have to strive and struggle to practice the religion of Islam. So when we die upon this religion, at least for when the angel of death snatch our soul, we live in this religion. How many of the youth, when you talk to them about Islam, they say, look, man, I'm young, I'm 20, I'm 30, I practice the religion of Islam when I get older. How many of the youth live next to the masjid, don't even pray in the masjid? I have a friend of mine in America. He accepted the religion of Islam maybe six, seven years ago. And alhamdulillah, I remember seeing his brother, alhamdulillah, he stayed in the masjid, alhamdulillah. He stayed making his prayers in the masjid. One day he was leaving the masjid. He happened to leave the masjid and he was in, this is in South Central LA. And he ran into a friend of his that he knew from Jahali and that asked him that he knew before he became Muslim. He asked him, can he give him a ride home? So when my friend, the brother Abdul Rahim, he put the individual in his car, he gave him a ride home. When he got in front of the person's house, this individual put a gun out. He shot the brother in the back of the, the, back of the head. And to this day, the brother's paralyzed from the neck down. When the brother got out of the hospital, the first thing that he asked his parents to do, can you please move me across the street from the mansion? This is an individual, he cannot move nothing from the neck down. But he wanted to move across the street from the mansion so that he can be in the mansion making his prayer five times a day with what? His eyelids. Many of us, alhamdulillah, we healthy. We live close to the mansion, but we don't enter the mansion. Many of us, we want to go to the gym, we want muscles, but we don't want to wake up for fajr. We can't even lift the sheets off our bodies. We weaken, we can't even, we don't have strength to wake up for fajr prayer. But then we feel that we some type of men. So it's very important, brothers and sisters, we're not here to talk down upon you, but I'm speaking to myself first that there is no isa, there is no happiness, there is no tranquility other than the religion of Islam. You're not gonna find it trying to be like Lil Wayne. You're not gonna find it trying to be like Tupac, even Tupac, who died as a non-Muslim. He got into a fight with an individual in a movie set. He walked away from $100,000, you know why? Because when he went to the set, they gave him the, the, to read a, 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 a script of a Muslim gangster. The first thing Tupac said is, I cannot play this role. He said, because there is no ex such thing as a Muslim gangster. He said, I will not play the role of something that doesn't exist. And to the point that he got into an argument, into a fist fight with the individuals and they called the police and put him in jail. When they interviewed Tupac and said, why did you walk away from $100,000? He said, because they're trying to get me to play a role that doesn't exist. There's no such thing as a Muslim gangster. Either you're a Muslim or you're a gangster. Even the non-Muslims know this. But what about us? Do we know the honor? Do we know the respect that we're supposed to give to this religion? Do we know the blessings and the barakah of being a Muslim? Do we know the greatest blessing that we can have in this dunya is the religion of Islam? And Allah said if we be shook, if we be grateful, He would give us more. What better way to show that Allah that we're grateful that He guided us to the religion of Islam by learning this religion and practicing this religion? Learning this religion and practicing this religion in my life will show that Allah that we're grateful that He guided us to this religion. Because it's not guaranteed that we will die upon this religion. We pray and we ask Allah to make us die upon this religion. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to make dua. Ya mukhalab al-kalu thabi kalbi ala dini. My Arabic messed up, but this is the dua the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to say, Oh Allah, control of the hearts, please keep my heart firm on your deen. If this was the message of Allah, we, we need that dua every second of our lives. So we should be thankful that Allah guided us to this religion, not act like gangsters, brothers. Wallahi, this is embarrassing. 
Because we have non-Muslims looking at us. We have non-Muslims looking at us when we walk outside and we live in their country. We should invite them to the religion of Islam. And invite them to the religion of Islam with good manners, with good o'clock. As the Prophet said on Yom Al-Qiyamah, the o'clock would be the heaviest on the scale. The heaviest on the scale on Yom Al-Qiyamah would be good manners. And part of good manners is being kind and adding doing just to your neighbors. And being kind to your neighbors. Man, you hear many not, you hear many Muslims when you say, look, man, why you don't call your neighbor to Islam? Oh, man, he's a Kafir. What type of understanding of Islam did we get this from? As the Prophet Sallallahu was telling, he was added to Jews and Christians living in Medina. As a narration of one of the, a Jewish kid who was on his deathbed. When they called the Prophet Sallallahu was telling and told him he was dying, the Prophet Sallallahu was telling he went to the Jewish kid on his deathbed and called the Jewish kid to Islam. And invited the Jewish kid to Islam and then when the little boy looked at his father, the father said, obey Abu Qasim, listen to him. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't say, oh, he's a Kafir, he's about to die, let him die. This is our example. We take our example from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba. We practice the religion of Islam with the understanding of the Sahaba because these are the individuals who the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught. So I don't want to bang you in the head too much. Maybe we go into questions and answers, but it's just a reminder as your brother that came from that life that none of you want nothing to do with that life. That many of you in this room was born on the religion of Islam, that this is a blessing from Allah, and one of the ways we show our gratitude to the blessings of Allah is being obedient to Allah. Staying away from sins, having good companions. Because I'm here to tell you right now that if you have a friend, and you think that he's your friend because he saved you the rest of alcohol, then it's a, a bad understanding that you have. If you think that Muhammad is your friend or, or, or Umar is your friend or Ali is your friend because he called you on the phone and said, come outside, I have a blunt for you. This individual is your enemy. This individual cannot be your friend. He's inviting you to, to be disobedient to Allah. How can he be your friend? A companion, a good friend of yours will remind you of Allah. When we slip, they will tell you to fear Allah. So it's very important, brothers, that we should change our companions. Our, should, our companions should be those that remind us of Allah. And you live in Sweden. You live in a beautiful country like this. Show the people of this country the beautiful face of the religion of Islam. But we will not know to show the people of Islam if we don't implement it and we don't learn it and practice it ourselves. So Jazakum Allah khair for your time. Maybe we could go into questions and answers.